Hey Matt43, welcome to the chapter 9 summary keynote and here we're going to think about how we can extend all that stuff we learned in chapter 7 about sampling distributions, whether I had again in mean land a numerical variable or if I was in proportion land with a categorical variable and thinking about again how what was the center, what was the standard error, how did I get normality, what were those assumptions and how does that play out in hypothesis test land. So let's take a look at a single sample hypothesis test. So in chapter nine, that's what we focus on. If you ever wanna go on and read about chapters 10, 11, 12, they, they go into like two samples and three samples. Might sound kinda of nerdy, but I actually think it's super exciting um, or super interesting, I should say. Like chapter 11 is my favorite chapter, period. Um, anyway, so going back to this, when you have a single sample hypothesis test, you're gonna have your null and your alternate, and there should be colons after them. Notationally, that's what I'm gonna to wanna to see. And then you should have a parameter, meaning you're either gonna have a mu or you're gonna have a p, just depending on if you're in mean land or proportion land. All right, and then you have the equal sign on the null and either a less than, a greater than, or a not equals to on the alternate. And you'll you'll determine that symbol based on the wording of the problem. So your null is, it's the status quo, nothing new is happening, we're assuming it's true, right? And, and if you're talking about testing out like a new medicine, you assume it doesn't work, right? The burden of proof is always to prove that it does work. The alternate, um, the burden of proof falls there, right? And the null and alternate together should be competing claims. So they should lead to different conclusions. If they led to the same conclusion, then what's the point? Now, like I said, always use colons after ho and ha, right? You're always gonna use parameters. So I only ever wanna see a mu or a p. I shouldn't see an x bar and I shouldn't see a p prime. The null should always have the equal sign. Even if it sounds like it really should be less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, that's fine. We always put the equals to on the null. All right, and then the symbol for the alternate will come from the context of the problem. Now, when we run a hypothesis test, there's always four outcomes, right? If the null is true and we keep it, that's a good thing. If the null is true and we, we reject it, that's a bad thing, that's a type one error. If the alternate's true and we keep the null, that's a bad thing, that's a type two error. But if the alternate's true and we keep it, or I should say we, we take the alternate, that's a good thing. So we wanna parse out the type one and type two errors. All right, so as we look at it, a type one error, if I wanna use the stats definition, which is totally fine, I use it all the time, right? We're gonna reject the null when the null is true. And that's a problem, right? You're rejecting something that's true. And a type two error, I love the wording on this, right? It's when you're failing to reject the null when it's false. Right, so you're you're failing to reject something even though it's not true. Now, when I was going, oops, let me back this up. Type one error, it's analogous to finding an innocent person guilty, and a type two error is analogous to finding a guilty person not guilty. And for me, when I was going through this, um, and when I say going through stats, when I was learning about this, I thought of a type one error as the first equation was true, Right, and I mistakenly chose the second equation. And when I say first equation, right, I would have my null, like mu equals 75 or something like that against the alternate. Uh, I could say mu was greater than 75. But when I say first equation, this is my first equation, this is my second equation. And the reason I put equation in quotes here is because technically the alternate is not an equation. So if it's a type one error, the first equation was true. And then I knew I made a mistake, so I must have picked the second. And I told myself, well, if it was a type two error, the second equation was true, meaning the alternate was true, and I mistakenly picked the first. Now, when you start to really think about why we say fail to reject um, versus reject, it, it, that is the proper terminology. I don't want to knock how stats wrote it. I'm just sharing with you something that helped me learn which, which error meant what when I was going through it. All right, alpha versus beta. So... Probability of a type one error, alpha. Probability of a type two error is beta. Um, alpha is also called the significance level or the level of significance. And you set your alpha. The industry standard is 5%. A lot of hypothesis tests have a 5% alpha. And if you wanna lower the risk of a type one error, you can lower your alpha threshold. If you're not as concerned about an, making an alpha error, you can raise your um, alpha level, or you can raise your alpha and raise that threshold. But again, the, not again, I should just say the, the consequence of lowering and raising alpha is that if alpha goes up, beta goes down, 
And if alpha goes down, beta goes up. So usually the game plan is we, before we even get going on our experiment, we look at what a type one and type two error mean in context. And we look at their consequences. And then we try and say, okay, well, if, if a type one error seems really bad, I'm gonna lower the alpha threshold. And I know that that means beta will likely go up or beta will go up, but that's okay, I'm willing to take that risk. And then if a type two error is worse, I really I, I want to lower my beta as much as I can because I don't want to make that type two error. So that means I'll raise my alpha so that I can have that happen. All right, here are your 13 steps. That's what I'm going to want to see on your free response. So let's let's break them down if you're in proportion land. All right, so if you're in proportion land, you've got your null and your alternate. You're going to put some colons after them. You're going to only use parameters. And if you're in proportion land, you're going to put P's. You're still going to put that equal sign on that null and you're going to determine your symbol for your alternate from the context of the question. Now when you hear about uh, not equals to alternate we refer to that as a two-sided test or sometimes you'll hear the phrase two-tailed test and it can be equivalent to a confidence interval. We looked at that a little bit in the chapter 9 lecture so if I had an alpha of five percent that would be completely equivalent. It, it, let me back this up. If I have an alpha 5% and a two-sided alternate, that's equivalent to a 95% confidence interval. Right? If my alpha was 10%, it would be equivalent to a 90% confidence interval. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a later slide. So if you've got a, a not equals to test, we call it two-sided or two-tailed. If it's a less than or a greater than, you might hear it referred to as a one-tailed test or a one-sided test. You might also hear the phrase left-tailed. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me write that on the correct one. So, oh, that was the correct one. Less than would be a left-tailed. And then sometimes you'll hear the greater than referred to as a right-tailed. All right. All right, let's take a look at the specifics though. Let's go through the 13 steps here. So step one, define the parameter. P is the true proportion of whatever you're talking about. Give me your null, give me your alternate, set your alpha, keeping in mind that the industry standard is 5%. If I don't give you an alpha, default to 5%. Check your assumptions, right? I want a random sample or a sample representing the population. I need at least 10 successes and 10 failures Based on the null, I want to stress here that this is a P that is right here. Right? You're using whatever number is in your null because we are assuming the null is true. All right? Your statistic, your P prime, does not show up until step 10. All right, I need my sample size small relative to my population so that I can sample without replacement. I'm going to be on the Z distribution or the standard normal curve, one sample proportion Z test, and I don't have degrees of freedom in proportion land. All right. There is the formula for my test statistic, right? and it's basically a z-score. That's all a test statistic is. It's just where did you fall on that standard normal curve? All right, I'm going to crunch that number. Step 10 is actually plugging in the numbers for my particular problem. P-value, I'm either going to have a right-tailed test, a left-tailed test, or a two-sided test. And the two-sided test is the more fun option. So let's just look at the less fun one. So the one-sided test, if I have a greater than alternate, I'm going to use a greater than symbol in my probability statement. If I have a less than alternate, I'm going to use the less than symbol in my probability statement. And when you hear me talking about this number right here, that's literally the number that you get from step 10. All right. And the symbol is coming from step 3. Now, if you have a not equals to test. You'll be on one of these options, all right? How do you determine this? If your number in step 10 is positive, you're gonna do a greater than alternate and double it for symmetry. If your number in step 10 is negative, you're gonna do a less than alternate, or excuse me, a less than calculation and double it for symmetry. And when I say double it for symmetry, it's because we have these two tails over here. So you're just gonna calculate the probability of one of those tails and then multiply it by two because that would give you both tails. All right, draw me a picture, state your conclusion. You owe me two sentences, one in context, uh, excuse me, one in theory, I should say. You're gonna actually say, I'm gonna reject or fail to reject the null and then one in context telling me if you have evidence or not for the alternate. All right, now in terms of that p-value, again, we've got either our right tails our left tails, or you can see it down here, our two tails. So if your z-score is positive, if you're on, it's hard for me to do this, but if you're on this side, right, if your z-score is positive, you're gonna calculate this area, oops, and then double it for symmetry. If your z-score is negative, you're gonna calculate this area and then double it for symmetry.
All right. Mean land, same deal, except now we're going to muse, right? Colons, make sure you're using parameters. Equal sign and the null. Alternate symbol comes from the context of the problem. Not equals to alternate, two-sided test or a two-tailed test. Less than, greater than, alternate, one-tailed test. All right, for mean land, define your parameter. State your null and alternate. Give me your alpha. Default to 5% if one's not given. For assumptions, still want random sample or sample representing our population. Normality is different. The population might be stated to be normal. The sample size might be large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in. Or a box plot of your raw data shows a roughly symmetric shape with no outliers. Now you could do a box plot, a histogram, a dot plot, stem and leaf, normal probability plot. Pick one. I typically do the box plot, so you'll see me doing that most often. And then tell me what your sample standard deviation is. For this class, we're always going to use the T distribution in mean land. All right, I, I mentioned in chapter eight, some folks will use the Z distribution if the sample size is 30 or higher. I just, I don't subscribe to that. All right, one sample mean T test, and then your degrees of freedom formula is N minus one. There's your test statistic. All right, we're going to crunch that number and then we're going to use that number, now when I say number, this thing, we're going to use that number to calculate our p-value in step 11. And again, your p-value is a probability, so that's why you can also sketch me a picture, because every probability has got some graph that matches it, and then state your conclusion. Right? Are you going to reject or fail to reject the null? Do you have evidence or not for the alternate? And still, going in on that p-value, right? If you have a greater than alternate, you're going to use a greater than symbol in your probability statement. If you have a less than alternate, you're going to use that less than symbol in your probability statement. If you have the not equals to, right, and your t-score is positive, you're going to use a greater than symbol and double it for symmetry. If you have the not equals to and your t-score is negative, you're going to use the less than symbol and double it for symmetry. Because ultimately, we're just finding these areas here, and since they're the same on both sides, just calculate the area of one tail and double it. All right. So if your p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null, which means you have sufficient evidence for the alternate. If your p-value is greater than alpha, you're going to fail to reject the null, so you do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate. All right, and so the lower your p-value, the less evidence you have for the null. You're getting that much more likely to reject it. All right, p-value, right? We know that we've been, we've been in step 12, creating this graph, this two-sided, well, this is a two-sided t-test, but this could also just be a two-sided, um, oh, excuse me, I was thinking something different. We're going to pretend my words didn't, didn't just happen. Um, so this is a two-sided test, not equals to alternate here. We've got our two tails. Um, we've got a one-sided z-test. We, if you went to chapter 13, I would show you the f-test, and it is awesome, but we're not going to go there. But it's still the same idea. There's some rejection region, or not rejection region, there's some kind of tail that we're, um, that we're highlighting here, or we're graphing. So p-value, it's the probability of getting a test statistic as at least as extreme as the one that was actually observed, assuming the null is true. So let me, let me back this out. A p-value is a probability, I wanna stress that. It's definitely a probability. So imagine, if you ran an experiment Something has to happen, right? So I'll, I'll go and I'll say like H not, mu is 75, HA, maybe the alternate is mu is, uh, I'll say not equal to 75. So when I run my experiment, I get my X bar, something has to happen. So like if I got something like 75.2, 75.2 is pretty close to 75, so maybe the null is true, right? But what if instead of 75.2, what if I got something like 100? right? A hundred point, I don't know, I'll put a hundred point nine, right? That seems a little bit further off. I'd, I'd need to know what the standard deviation was to know if that gap was really small or large, but this seems pretty far off. So what the p-value is doing is it's measuring the probability of that kind of gap because it's saying, what's the likelihood that if the mean was really 75, what's the likelihood I would get this test statistic or this sample data, the stuff that I actually observed just through chance alone, just because when you run an experiment, something has to happen. So that's what the p-value is doing. It's calculating the probability of this something happening pending the null was true. This is the ultimate conditional probability, right? Under the condition that the null is true, how likely is it that my sample mean or my statistic would pop up with this value? And that's what the probability or the p-value is doing. What's the likelihood 
that you would get that test data, that experiment data, just through chance alone. Just because when you run an experiment, something has to happen. So how likely was your particular something? All right, so with that, let's take a look at relating confidence intervals to two-sided tests. So for every two-sided hypothesis test, there's an equivalent confidence interval that goes with it. All right, so confidence intervals, right, we, we talk about the middle 95%. In the hypothesis test, we talk about the tails. So, or... I'm doing it for a 95% example. Um, so let's, let's take a look at an example. So let's say we had a 95% confidence interval for the mean weight of all dull pineapples grown in the field this year. Um, and we think that the average, the true average, is somewhere between 31.255 ounces and 32.616 ounces. All right, so just take a step back. We think that the true average weight for all these dull pineapples is somewhere between these two numbers. All right. If I gave you this null and this alternate, what do you think you would do? Would you reject H0 or would you fail to reject H0? Now, look at H0. It's saying right here, hey, I'm telling you, I'm going to assume that mu is 31. Based on this confidence interval, do we think mu is 31 or do we think mu is something other? It's not equal to 31. And if I were to forward this slide, you're going to see that show up in purple. Why? Because 31 is not in this confidence interval. All right, if 31 was in the confidence interval, I actually would have um, failed to reject H0. But when you have a two-sided test at some kind of alpha level, you're going to reject the null if that interval does not contain that parameter. Right? And take a look. Right? I rejected H0. I, I would say here I would reject H0 because 31 is not in our interval. Right, because that's what our interval is saying. It's actually saying, I think mu is this. I think it's between 31.2 and 32.6, right? I actually personally like confidence intervals better because it tells me what the mu is, right? It says it's between 31.2 and 32.6. Where all this was telling me here is just that mu wasn't 31. So I actually personally like confidence intervals better, but the real world tends to like hypothesis tests better. So if you have a two-sided test and your interval is in, and you can see it contains that hypothesized value, that's when we would fail to reject the null. Okay? All right. So some common terminology you're going to hear. If you hear me talk about justify or is there evidence, you're going to run a hypothesis test. If you hear me say, hey, estimate a parameter, means I want you to construct a confidence interval. If I ask you, are these data statistically significant or not, your answer, it's a yes or no question. It comes down to, did you reject the null? If you rejected the null, we would call that data statistically significant. It's significant enough for us to change our mind, to reject the, the status quo, the null. And then if you hear about standard error, that's always that denominator in steps 9 and 10. We talked about standard error in chapter 7. It's always the standard deviation of your sampling distribution. All right, there is chapter nine, gang. Thanks so much, and I will see you later. Bye.